do today is finish off the completeness theorem and then move on to the downward levenheim skolem theorem, which we can dispatch quite quickly here. And I can talk again then some more about the compactness theorem, which you came across before under Charles Morgan. So let's finish off the completeness theorem first. <clears throat> so I'm looking at pages 78, 79 here in the notes. We want to f this will also recap or we'll also talk a little bit about what we did last time. So we need to finish off theorem 416, which is page 75. And this was called the adequacy theorem. <clears throat> and essentially, it's this direction of the completeness theorem. And we were going to get this as a corollary to this one. Any consistent set of sentences has a model. So what did we actually achieve then so far? <clears throat> So for 417 here, all right, so this is just the argument on the bottom of page four, page 78 here. We took in a language, a set of sentences gamma here. And what we did first, what we did was we had this routine which took infinitely many steps of expanding gamma alternately to a consistent complete set and then a consistent full set. We did this infinitely often and took the union. So what we ended up with, we said that we showed that there was a gamma extending, a gamma prime extending gamma. Right? Gamma prime was then in a language L prime, which was an extension by constants to get the fullness of our language L here. So our language L here is countable. We added countably many constants at each stage of this process and our final language was countable. And so we then had this gamma prime which was complete, full, and consistent. And then we saw if you've got something like this, so this was lemma then 420, um, 426, Gamma prime had kind of a model or structure here in which all the sentences in gamma prime was true. So the structure here was 
for the language L prime here. And in the structure here, everything that's in gamma prime comes out true. So we say it's, it, this is a model for these sentences, or it's a structure for these sentences in which it comes out true. So what have we done? We've expanded this consistent set to this larger consistent set and found a model for it. Well, the theorem says any consistent set of sentences has a model. So I want a, a set of, I want a model for this set of sentences, but actually this one is, because the only difference here is that this structure here perhaps has constants to interpret the new, well, it will have constants objects to interpret the new constant symbols that there are in I prime. So I gamma prime here. So this is going to consist of the domain, which is those collection of equivalence classes. And then there were various, um, there were going to be interpretations for the um, relation symbols and then for the function symbols. And then there are the original constants, perhaps. And then there were these new constants that we added on. Let me just enumerate them like this. Our original gamma was in this language without these constants. And it had things like these p's and f's and the original constants that you might have in L here. But all we have to do is just get rid of these constants. I can just reduce the structure. So we look at the reduct. Sometimes people think this is a kind of mysterious process. It's just throwing away the constants. I just reduce it to a language L. And it's the i's and the p's and the f's and the old constants of the language L. And we've just deleted these things. But this here is still, a, this is a model of our original gamma because gamma is contained in gamma prime over here. All we've done is just throw away this extraneous new baggage, which was only there as a tool to get fullness so that we could use the canonical model here, construction. Really, we're just interested in the model of gamma. So there's new stuff we don't really care about. So we can just, now we've got our structure, we can just throw away these constants here. So now we can have a structure in our original language, right, which is the model of our gamma. So this gives us 417. Right? Now I said 416 is a corollary of 417. Right? So how do we get 416? And so this is top of page 79. So let's suppose we've got a gamma and phi here. Gamma contained in the language, uh, phi is also there in the language as well. Okay, so contrapositive, right? Suppose I can't deduce using the laws of predicate calculus phi from gamma. Here. Okay, well, phi is equivalent to not not phi, just using again the laws of logic. So this is logically equivalent to this here. So then by 
3.9e, gamma together with naught phi is consistent. So by we've just what proven by what we've just proven um, by theorem four sixteen there's a structure in which this consistent set of sentences comes out to be true. Hence, it's not the case that every model of gamma is a model of phi, because this would be a model of gamma with not phi. So that proves the contrapositive of this here. Then, <coughs> The completeness theorem is just a conjunction of the adequacy theorem and the soundness theorem. Soundness is this is the other direction here. Okay, completeness theorem. <clears throat> I got a collection of sentences in L. So this is just stating it loud and clear. So proof, okay, this is adequacy theorem plus soundness. Here. So again, just to emphasize, suppose for a moment gamma is empty here. What we have here is something is a theorem of logic, a predicate calculus, if and only if it's universally valid. It's true in all structures here. which is the basis of the corollary 428. The theorems of our deductive system are exactly the universally valid formulae. So I'm saying formulae here because we can prove formulae in the system, not just sentences. So there's a little bit to say here. This was about sentences, the completeness theorem. But there's a little bit to say about formulae with free variables in as well. Okay, so let's take gamma to be the empty set. And find our formula of the language. And we'll suppose that it's free variables are contained in V1 up to Vn. Here. Well, V1 
if I quantify the free variables, this is now a sentence. There are no longer any free variables. But the completeness theorem Right. This gives here a sentence here, if and only if the sentence is provable here. So, but now we just remark about previous exercise says this is universally valid if and only if the thing without the quantifiers is. This I hope is 318A. So phi is universally valid if and only if the for all sentence is universally valid. And the same thing is true over here. The formula is derivable if and only if the quantified formula here is derivable here. In one direction, we're using one of the axioms. And then in this direction, we're using the generalize, uh, sorry, we're using R2, the generalization rule n times to put quantifiers in front of this, this formula here. So we end up with, um, um, particular formula here, it's universally valid if and only if, and if it's universally quantified, sorry, phi is universally valid if and only the corresponding sentence is universally valid if and only if that sentence is provable if and only if phi itself <clears throat> is provable. So I end up with this if and only if this. So okay, maybe I'll just say. We have this here, also for formulae. Here. So maybe this <clears throat> should go in there before the QED. So one more observation on what we've done as well, it's theorem 429. <clears throat> if I've got a consistent set of sentences in a countable language, The canonical model we constructed was itself countable. So the canonical interpretation. So the I sub gamma we constructed yesterday. Um, I'm sort of giving the proof as part of the statement. Um, the canonical interpretation, I gamma, is countable. So a countable set of sentences has a countable model.
I mean, again, just to just to emphasize that a little bit. I mean, to recap, what did we do here? These are the notes from from yesterday. We we took our consistent gamma. We had this process of expanding it just by throwing in countably many constants all the time. We did this a countable number of stages, throwing in countably many constants, right? At the, at the, at the stages where we went to a delta. We took the union of these countably many sets, countably many of them. So the gamma star and the language that we ended up with was also countable. But then we looked at the canonical structure, but that was just taking, yeah. So this canonical interpretation or canonical structure, right, consisted of these equivalence classes of terms in this accountable language. So there are only, there are only countably many of these equivalence classes here, which make up the domain of the structure. So we started from our countable gamma, we end up with this countable structure in which gamma is true. Which is the statement of this 429 <coughs> here. But in essence, that's uh, what the Lovenheim, downward Lovenheim scholar theorem says. So just taking this from the next chapter. So this is called downward Lovenheim Skolem. Yeah, sometimes just written as DLS <coughs> to abbreviate. So I take a set of sentences in this countable language. Now, yeah. Then if gamma has a model, it has a countable model. So if I need to look for structures for a set of sentences, I don't need to search through the whole universe. I can just look at countable models and see whether one of those is a model for the, for the, for the sentences. And the proof is essentially, well, what we've just done. Right? Well, if gamma has a model, then it is consistent. If a set of sentences has a model, it means they are, those sentences are really true in that model. So I can't have in that model both some sentence sigma being true and being false, right? It makes no sense. So it has to be consistent. Then by the proof 417, if it's consistent, it has a countable model, which is all what DLS asserts. Now this has some kind of um, 
People were slightly puzzled about this at the beginning. Right? So let's look at an example. Let's look at the reels. So here are the reels with plus and times, okay, minus, not quite sure why I've got minus one in there, plus one, and zero. Maybe you might want to have some other things in here, but let's say that here. Now this is, the reels are uncountable. But the language we're talking about is countable. It's only got these two constants and two functions, or let's, yeah, two function symbols. Yeah. <clears throat> so the language appropriate to R is countable. Right, I mean, let's call it L of R here. So let's look at everything that's true in R. So this is the theory of L of R. So recall this by definition, this is the collection of sentences which are true in the structure. So, so I just remark, this is a complete theory, complete set of sentences, because everything is either true or false in R. So for any sentence of the language, either it or its negation is in here. But it's a countable set of sentences. Countable, and not that this is so important for this discussion, it's complete and it's a consistent set of sentences because everything in gamma is true in the structure R, so it must be consistent. So it has a countable model or interpretation. So there's some countable R star. So it'll have some domain and now a countable collection of objects here. It will have some version of plus and times some interpretation of its these constants. Like this here. And everything that's true in R here is precisely what's true in R star. So I deliberately written gamma down here as the theory of R. So in terms of what we can express in the language, there is absolutely no difference between discussing R here and this countable R star. Um, I better make, make, this will look confusing if I've, let's call this R star. So the slogan one gets out of the downward lovenheim scholem theorem here is that the uncountability of R plays no role when one considers what one can prove in terms of plus times one and zero.
So the uncountability of R plays no role when discussing in analysis what's provable about R if I'm just using this vocabulary here. Plus times one and zero. Now you may, you might say, well, hang on a moment. I mean, we did things in analysis or well, back in the first year, we discussed countable, uncountable sets of reals, but true. But then if you were to make that formal, you wouldn't be talking just in the simple language here. You'd be talking about something um, where in a language had much, much more expressive power, right? Okay, sorry, my computer is trying to update something. So why is gamma consistent again? Uh, gamma is consistent because the theory of any structure is always consistent. Um, so let's say here, if M is any structure or again, I use the word model or interpretation, the theory of the structure is, <clears throat> is always a complete By the completeness theorem, we know that to be consistent is the same thing as saying you've got a model. Well, of course you've got a model because this was defined to be the collection of things true in this model. And it's complete for the same reason I said before. Everything, every sentence is either true or it's false. So consistent set has a model, right, is the completeness theorem. Right? And anything true in a model must be consistent. Did that answer sufficiently? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Okay, I don't sound too convinced, but um, I'm happy to say some more. Yeah, so what's the, I thought, because we did that as, as a homework, I think, uh, to prove consistency of any theory of M. But we didn't use the um, the completeness theorem, so I'm just a little. Um, well, confused. I'm just saying, if you've got a consistent theory, it will always have a model. That was perhaps irrelevant to my answer. What I should have said to you, but I mean, if I've got a structure here, I can't have both this and this true in the structure, right? One of these must fail. Right? So if I've got that everything that's in gamma here is true in the structure M, and if from gamma I can deduce some sentence tor, then I know that tor is true in M. Because the rules of proof preserve validity, right? preserve truth. So if this is true in a structure and I can prove Tor from gamma, then Tor is true in the structure. So I can't have that from a gamma, I could prove both Tor and a not Tor. So we could not have that from this gamma, 
we could prove both gamma tor and gamma proves not tor, i.e. gamma being inconsistent. Because if I could do that, I would know that both tor and not tor are true in M, which is a contradiction. So we could not have that from this gamma, we could prove both gamma. I gamma is inconsistent. I mean, this is just spelling it out now. As then we'd have the tor is true in M and not tor is true in M, right? So bolt of lightning, that's a contradiction. That's a contradiction by the definition of a theory, theorem, right? Yes, I mean, the, I mean, it's like saying, well, I've got something, you know, maybe M is a group, I can't have that something is both true and false in that group. Right? It's, oh, okay. just, it's just logic, right? I mean, we're not entertaining truths and falsities at the same time. We're just being classical logicians. Right? And the rules of deduction prove, uh, sorry, preserve being true in a model. So if I start out with something that's true in M, anything I can prove from that set of sentences is also true in M. And because I can't have in M something both true and false, I can't prove from gamma both something and its negation. So gamma has to be consistent. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. So the construction of the completeness theorem actually gives us a lot more. It gives us an easy proof of the compactness theorem, right? Which was mentioned in Charles Morgan's lectures, but not proven. The compactness theorem. So we take a countable language. Actually, I'm only going to, in this course, we'll only consider countable languages. Charles did say, mentioned the possibility about working with uncountable languages, but um, we'll, we'll not go there in this, this part of the course. So. So I take a set of um, sentences. Then the compactness theorem will say gamma has a model structure, which is true, if and only if every finite subset does. So, I mean, this is, I mean, actually, it's quite a simple observation, but in, but just the statement of it is quite remarkable. I mean, this is an infinite collection. You might think, well, there is something I can say about, you know, using an infinite collection of sentences, which, even though every finite subset might be true in some structure, then the whole lot would not be true in a structure. But the compactness then rules that out. It just says it's enough to know that gamma is true in a structure if and only if every finite subset is true in a structure. And we do it without stringing together different structures to make a mega structure here. We just use the, the logic that we've proven so far with the completeness theorem. So left to right. 
if gamma is a model, then it's trivial that every finite subset does. So this is this direction is kind of trivial. So I could just say this is trivial, this direction, because it's just a subset of that. So in the other direction, suppose gamma has no model. But what we've been doing, this means it can't be a consistent set of sentences, right? because every consistent set of sentences has a model. So gamma is then inconsistent here. So that's, well, it's the completeness theorem, or more particularly theorem 417. But if, and now we've transferred it from the kind of semantic sphere about having structures to saying, oh, something syntactic happens about gamma, right? In my proof system, I could prove a statement and its negation. Right? But that proof would only take finitely many axioms. But then there is a finite gamma zero contained in gamma, which is inconsistent. If I can deduce a contradiction from gamma, that proof only used finite amount of gamma in the lines of that argument. But if this finite is in gamma zero is inconsistent, this also can't be true in a structure. So gamma zero has no model. Here. So we've proven if gamma has no model, there's some finite gamma zero, which has no model. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, that's, I ran over last time. And so maybe this time I will pay you back by running under. Um, do look at example, and perhaps we'll do this next time. It's one which Charles already did, in fact, it was a non-standard model of arithmetic. These can be kind of fascinating, these structures. What you do is take the standard model of arithmetic, Yeah, the natural numbers here. And you add on things at the end. You add on interpretations for some new constants. But nevertheless, every theorem of number theory, right, will be true in this expanded structure here. But it's got kind of number, pseudo numbers that come after all of the actual counting numbers. Okay, we'll look at that uh, next time. Um.